Hi, I'm Matt Lieb. And I'm Vince Mancini. And this is Pod Pod Yourself Yourself The the Wire. Wire. A The Wire podcast where Vince Mancini and I go through every single episode of The Wire and And talk talk about about it. it. I'm so excited. (laughs) Wow, don't do that now. We just started. Did we both just burp at the same time? No. Oh, I thought you were yawning. No, 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 no. I was burping because oh, uh, I just had some salmon. Mm-hmm. I'm very excited for everyone Man. to be here listening to the hey, world's only The Wire does podcast. Does room smell like jizz now? Does your jizz smell like salmon? <laughs> no, because you burp. Never mind. Uh, oh, I get it. I get, I, I get it. Your salmon thing stepped all over my stupid joke. It's fine. It's fine, man. I bet it was we're a good pro, joke. We're pros. Yeah, we're doing the best we can. Uh, five stars in a review, please. Give us a comment. Uh, like and subscribe. All that stuff, please. And when I say that, don't just tune it out, you fucking bitch. Do it. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Why are you fucking tuning me out? Shut up. <laughs> Sacramento Punchline Me, March 17th, 7 p.m. Buy ticket now. In link <laughs> bio, please. Um. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Very excited for today's episode. Great show. We have great show. We have great show lined up Very for you. Excited. A fantastic guest of fun and great episode of Wire. So today we're going to be talking about from season five of The Wire, episode seven, Took. Yes, we're talking about Took. And our guest this week is not a journalist. No, no, no. We have an actor. Uh, a great actor and homie of the show, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else. Welcome our guest, Brendan Sexton the Third. Yay! Thanks for having me. How are Thanks you guys? for coming on, man. How you been? Good, man. Good. It's good to see your face again. I know it's been too long. It's been too long. I feel like uh, you know I've been trapped inside because I have a child. Yes. And I haven't. I haven't been able to like hang out with the homies. Yes. And, what what do you guys Damn been up to? child wearing have you guys yeah. been like having fun like going out and stuff yeah well that's cool <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, there's like a fun, whole world man. out there man there's like yeah, 8 I billion people the, it's kind of cool i kind of you know sometimes do you ever miss covid because like when covid happened it was like huh. oh no we have to stay inside well that sucks yeah there's but, no yeah. fomo yeah. yeah terrible i'm i'm still wearing covid sweatpants i haven't you know, nice. I haven't graduated to previous normalcy. Yeah. I'm yeah, in yeah. a new normal. New normal is COVID sweatpants and just hanging out with your your one true love inside and never leaving. <laughs> Not doing a damn thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but th- let's talk about wires for a second. Um, Brandon yes. Sexton, yes. the third. Moi. Do you like the wire? I do. I do like The Wire. I enjoy it quite a lot. I was reluctant to watch it at first when it first aired because I thought it was another war on drugs show. I thought Mm -hmm. it was a propaganda show. Yeah. And I wasn't going to watch some propaganda bullshit. Yeah. And then a few of my drug dealing friends were like, no, you got to watch them. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, 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 it's real. <laughs> yeah. It's actually quite good. Yeah. And so I started the wire with my girlfriend at the time on season four, when season four mm-hmm. aired without beautiful. watching the previous three seasons. And in a way it's, it was a beautiful way to introduce yourself to the wire. Cause yeah. that's, that's probably the best season. Oh, and yeah. those kids just got on screen and could not lie. And it was just such a good season and great introduction to the show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, speaking of great seasons of The Wire, what are your thoughts on season five? I would say season five's main problem is that it's not season four. Mm. Yeah, and I agree. If, if season yeah. five had to do itself over again, it should have chosen to be season four because then it would have been better. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I, 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 I think I think season five is not the greatest, but I do think part of the criticism of it is the letdown from season four. It's just season four 100%. was such a difficult high to replicate. I completely agree. We're we're a season five apologists here. You know, we right we, on. we yeah, find yeah. that season five uh gets a, a lot of undue criticism and then also some very 
legit like, legit criticism. Criticism. Well, accurate criticism and yeah, accurate yeah, criticism. There you go. yeah. sure yeah. well it's but, like yeah oh it's the worst wire season it's like oh okay it's the poorest billionaire great yeah like, right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's a good yeah. way of looking at it yeah oh i'm sorry it's the saggiest titty like at <laughs> the end of the day it's still You're going still, in my mouth yeah. Yeah. <laughs> agree agree you know what i mean i do um, very much so <laughs> but uh brendan you are an actor um and you know i've i've been familiar with your work for a long time you were uh you were in uh, welcome to the the doll house um you were in boys right. don't cry you were in right. empire all Records. these movies are 30 years old by the way at this well point. no i know but i'm still but i listen i could go into your imdb and pick ones from recent like uh don't breathe too yes yeah see I, that movie was not shot in baltimore it was not. <laughs> no, oh, that's, that's too bad. I did what, do a Baltimore movie, though. Oh, you did? What, yeah, you I, do? I, I was in a John Waters film. I was in Pecker, which we oh. shot in 97, at the end wow. of 97. Yeah, so I, I have some Be More experience, you know? Did you, you know, when you were watching The Wire, um, <laughs> did you, was there part of you that was like, how do I get on this show? Like, did you watch I, season two? I'll be honest. Like, I auditioned yeah. for The Wire before I oh. ever saw it. I auditioned for season two. I remember fighting with my agent about going in on it. And I was like, I don't like the character. Also, I'm wrong for it. Yeah. And, you know. Um, oh, were you going to be Frog? Who is this yeah, Frog? frog. I, was just gonna, I was trying to remember his name. He's yeah. the one in season two who's like. Uh, he goes Ziggy in on a package him, with, with Ziggy. Yeah, Ziggy and gives him money. And he rips Ziggy off. Right? And he rips Ziggy yeah. off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was that guy. And I was oh. watching it and I was like, this kid's fucking brilliant. And it, yeah, I know. Probably that, from the neighborhood. You no, know? 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was like, why'd you put me through that when I knew <laughs> that's what you should naturally do? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, uh, you know, you know, there's I, a John Waters joke in this season, right? Like there's a wait. What yes, 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 yes. There is. There is. Yeah. They're in the newsroom and oh. they say we have John Waters doing a new movie. We have cover art. It's him posing with child actors with child yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. gus says is that is that allowed yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then he says let's separate the art from the artist right yep. so yep. wow well, see and, you claim that you didn't remember this episode that well but you remember but i remember that i remember sequence. the good ones from this season no I, yeah, yeah. No, 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 doubt. No, no doubt. yeah this this one you know um i i gotta say this is probably the first episode and then we've watched six others it's the first right. one where i was a little bit like Oh, okay, so it is not the best season of mm -hmm. Wires. Yeah, but it's still, you know. Sag, it's still a wire. It's still a saggy still breast. It's still um, right was now. John Waters cool? John Waters was lovely. Like, he's such a nice man. And yeah. he was, like, definitely, you know, I when I was working with him, I was a child actor. I was a minor, and I had to have a guardian on set, and he was especially he was so concerned about like my supposed virgin ears and like didn't oh. want me watching his previous movies. And I was like, dude, I'm already a fan. Like female trouble is my favorite. Like I'm already, yeah. I'm more corrupt than you can imagine. <laughs> I feel like I'm I, 17 I, and I live in New York and I'm an actor. I'm out of my fucking mind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I feel like it's almost a hundred percent degree. It's almost a hundred percent correct that like people that have sort of a, perverse naughty uh public persona are always the nicest people and Absolutely. all the people yes. that have the most wholesome public personas are fucking evil behind the scenes. yeah yeah Absolutely. it's almost it's it's a rule of thumb he was super wholesome and he's always super supportive and i remember like i i saw him when he was doing stand-up like in 2010 or something you know yeah he would mail me his christmas card for years until i changed Aww. the dresses and stuff yeah it's just such a lovely sweet I love person. that. Yeah. I love yeah, that. But you know guy. what? This is not a show about John Waters. Yeah. No. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. <laughs> He's never moved a key in his life. Actually, he yeah. probably moved a lot of keys. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> can imagine. Divine probably had all sorts of shit in the trunk of their Cadillacs. I mean, yeah. listen, you got to fund a movie somehow. Yes. Um, <laughs> but this is a show about The Wire. And we, of course, cannot start the podcast without first playing the theme song. <clears throat> Season five. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, everyone else. Today, once again, we're talking about from season five of The Wire, episode seven, Took, which premiered 
February 17th, 2008. Vince, break us off a little piece of that synopsis. <laughs> I sure can do that. Uh, an unexpected call puts Templeton back in the spotlight whilst, McNul- whilst getting McNulty more attention than he expected. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Omar sends Marlo a message. That is true. But what else happened? I mean, not in the show. Just, in the world, That's dog. right. Yeah, that's right. We can't evaluate art divorced from its cultural context. We have to put some of that cultural context back in, and we do that with the little thing that we call the back in the day machine. It's a bad time for newspapers. The news hole is shrinking as advertising dollars continue to decline. There ain't no back in the day machine tells the tale, son. Yes, it does. Yeah, I was just going, uh, like I happened upon... One of Bomani Jones's old uh, Wire reviews and one of his comments on this season was that the uh, the editors at the Washington Post, they seem like white characters written by black comedians, which... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Makes me laugh. And, and when I see that guy's face in the back in the day machine clip, I'm like, oh, I see. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> um, we're going all the way back to February 17th, 2008. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of things were happening. Dwight Howard wore a cape at the dunk contest. You probably whack. remember. Whack. Sha- Shaq is the original Superman. Fuck Dwight Howard. Yeah. yeah. That's and corny. He's also, yeah, he's also kind of not funny in general. He's very annoying. Anyway. Uh, Dwight Howard, here's the thing about Dwight Howard. And yeah, we're going to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, My yeah, problem yeah. with him has always been that he was someone who, based on pure p- physicality, was able to uh, be looked at as some sort of like franchise player superstar. Right. And I remember when they, uh, the Magic got to the finals against the Lakers and right. being a, l- a little scared because I was like, oh my God, like, you know, this is the second yeah. coming of Shaq. The kid and was a see- physical specimen for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's like a huge guy. He's got these beautiful shoulders and, yeah. uh, and uh, he had no footwork, no passing. <laughs> he had nothing. And I was yeah. like, who, who, who the fuck is this guy? Anyways, <laughs> his game didn't bother me as much as there was that period where they were like, let's turn Dwight Howard into uh, like a personality. Like they were trying to turn him into the next right. Shaq in, you, in also in like the acting and entertainment realms. And I was do like, do you remember this, when he was yeah. talking shit on Stan Van Gundy at that press conference and then Stan <laughs> no. Van Gundy walked in on the press conference? <laughs> no, I don't. No. And, and, and yes. And Dwight tried to play it off. Oh, uh, <laughs> fucking fucking awful and it's like stan made you bro like yeah he taught don't you, you, he taught yeah. you the pick you, and roll you can <laughs> yeah and guess what you never really learned the pick and roll did you you fucking <laughs> he taught you as best as he could but you can't do shit i just remember uh, when they would do bits where it was like and uh and dwight howard takes over the espn desk for a day what a wacky guy and i was uh, like yeah. This guy is no. Uh, he's not Shaq. He's, he's not, not Shaq. Yeah. Shaq trying too can hard take to make over the wacky, ESPN yeah. desk, and exactly. TNT was smart enough to realize that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, other things that were happening: uh, the financial crisis has not quite reached a fever pitch, but uh, you know there it are did signs. For me back then, I was broke as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, same, same. But also, I was on a lot of drugs at the time, so I was I was, broke I was for my flush on student loans that I would later have to pay back. Oh, yeah. I still have uh, not done. That. I hate that you have to. No, pay those I, back. I had a negative bank account for sure. Nice. I was definitely. Uh, headline from the New York Times: Britain to nationalize Northern Rock. That is the Northern fifth largest, Rock. fifth largest mortgage lender in the UK. Wow. Uh, decision to nationalize Northern Rock. Came after the government rejected two takeover proposals for the struggling mortgage lender, which ran into trouble because of funding shortage triggered by the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States. Crazy. The British public is now on the hook for about $108 billion in loans and guarantees to the bank. I was working at a doctor's office at the time, and I remember <laughs> watching like all the shit go down and being a little bit like... This doesn't really affect my ability to steal prescription pads. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really see uh, yeah. if this is Did bad. Did you turn that into a side hustle? 
No, it was just for me. It was for my own personal. That's I couldn't. I, I I had trouble. I'm not a good businessman. They, they would have caught up with you anyway. Right. Yeah. And I for I just you know for my own personal use, I figured if I do get in trouble, you know, at least I won't be in as as much trouble. And also, you, listen, you want it's very hard to sell drugs if you're not someone who's like built for it. Like right. it just you end up feeling bad because you're like. You can just have some drugs. <laughs> <laughs> you seem like you need some. Yeah. Like, I've been yeah. there, dude. I know it feels bad not having drugs. So you, you can just have some. I, I mean, I, I this your business sense, it, it really explains a lot of why this podcast hasn't uh, taken over no, the world since exactly. we partnered. To, Ooh, you know? cold, cold. No, he's right, though. There's he's a right. rift. There's a no, rift. If, yeah. if I was a good businessman, we would I'm not be saying t- I am. I was just hoping. Oh, you're like terrible. You would, you, but you already you, know. You're, you're, you're the Ziggy. You're the Ziggy. Ziggy of the bunch and Vince is the Pablo Schreiber. No. Well, no. yeah, I think that's right. And nah, I'm not, uh, I, I don't think Matt's that bad or I'm that I, good. I think we're both somewhere like, I think we're both more like I'm the Ziggy's Ziggy, duck. You're you know? like Ziggy's duck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to drink yourself to death in a saucer Ziggy's of whiskey. Got a duck. <laughs> Damn. Damn. Yeah. Uh, other stories. Uh, I call this one. Where's the beef? It's getting recalled. <laughs> uh, is this mad uh, cow? Oof. Are we talking mad cow? A California meat packer accused of animal cruelty is making the largest U.S. meat recall on record. Oh. Uh, most of Wait. the meat, 143 million pounds of fra- raw and frozen beef produced in the last two years, probably has already been consumed. Thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, what was wrong with it? If it was just that he was mean to them, I don't really get it. Hallmark Westland Meat Packing <laughs> voluntarily recalled all of its beef produced since February 1st, 2006. The department said Hallmark violated rules against the slaughter of downer cattle or animals too ill to walk. But enough about Matt's mom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you bitch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Humane Society of the United States showed videotapes showing workers at the plant using several abusive techniques to make animals stand up and pass a pre-slaughter inspection. These included right. ramming cattle with forklift right. blades and you using can't, a hose. You can't kill this. sick animals. Yeah. Right? They or have to be too. They have them. to be like healthy enough to stand, and they violated <laughs> that one, I guess. And using oh, a hose to simulate the feeling of drowning. So they were they were waterboarding the beef. Oh man. Okay. I, yeah, I don't want to eat that beef. No, I don't. Want I that agree either. with them now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. Well, before I was like, yeah, yeah what are you gonna? Eat? Yeah, you're mean to some cows. I mean, I'm I'm already eating them. What's more mean <laughs> well, you than that? Ate it. I like that they recalled it at, like two years after the meat the meat was uh, processed and sold. So do they get fined? Do they get fined like three million bucks or something for that? I, I yeah, hope so. I think there's a fine involved. I remember the forklift. There was a video of that, mm. and I remember being like, "Well, they're just trying to help them up." <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> sure, sure, right? they're heavy. Another is, one. Um, yes. Here's an, another story for you. Toshiba set to yield in DVD format war. Uh, Toshiba is planning to give up on its HD DVD format for high definition de- DVDs, conceding hmm. defeat to the competing Blu-ray technology backed by Sony. Oh, who'd have thunk it? Yeah. Smart on Toshiba's part, by the way. You yeah. think? Yeah, I because by 2012, streaming was the wave. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, I guess someone's still making a little money on DVDs, but it's oh, really, sure. it's like the... For you sure. mean Blu-ray? So, Sony, yeah. Sony, their whole business model is to create technologies and try to force the market to only use that technology. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they did so with... DVDs as well? No, wait. What was the the thing they did it with? Um, there was another technique. Not well, beta. Well, well, this well was they just... tried it with mini disc, but they, yes, you know, yes. like the Walkman mm. and things like that. Like it's always they. It's yeah. Always their style. I don't remember who made VHS beat out Betamax, but right. a similar situation. I saw in a movie or something that it was like had something to do with porn, and I was mm. like, that that also sounds right. Well, it was very dumb. We had a Betamax when I was a kid. I remember going into the video store and like yeah. trying to find shit on Betamax. And it got oh, of course you did. You were a, a Max to Beta. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what's with me today. No, it was funnier because you stretched harder. 
<laughs> Beta was Betamax was smaller. It was oh, more gosh. portable and higher definition, but somehow VHS right, better quality. Yeah, yeah it was better said. quality and more portable, and yet it lost. Uh, so it goes. Um, finally, we got a battle over some some delegates. Mm. Uh, the dwindling group of elected officials and party leaders publicly undecided in the Democratic presidential contest. About 300 out of the 795 so-called superdelegates who may determine the party's nominee includes at least 30 who have a long and often personal history with the Clinton family. Uh, but more than 100 that of them... That sounds democratic. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but more than 100 of them are from states whose voters have spoken in primaries and caucuses and voted, often overwhelmingly, for Senator Barack Obama. Uh, well, there's a good quote in here. The delegates are under no obligation to vote as they say they will. Already they are showing a willingness to change their minds. As Clinton was reminded when Representative John Lewis of Georgia switched course and said he would vote for Obama at the convention. That's uh, I'm joining hope. the Witness Protection Program, said Debbie Kozakowski, an undecided superdelegate from Massachusetts. Uh, I told President Clinton on Sunday night when he called here that I remained uncommitted. I told, that I, appre- I told him I appreciated him calling, but even he is not going to get me to do something. Uh, I mean, be careful. That's all I got to yeah, say. Yeah, I know. L- listen, <laughs> yeah, check out that Clinton kill list. You know what? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's. The, I think we're properly contextualized. Are we contextualized? Is that everything yeah. that happened? Yeah, now we know. It. That's everything. I that's mean, other all than a, a suicide bomb killing eighty people in Afghanistan, that was Boy. that was another thing that happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't care about that war anymore at this point. Yeah. No. At that point, I was like, we're still there. Yeah. What? I Ooh. forgot it about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're probably going to be out next year or something, we thought back then. Yeah, I don't, I don't even care. Just get through this election. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Just deal with this so election just, and yeah, don't care just, about the dead guys. If I just vote, it'll be okay. That's what Yeah. Don't boo. Um, <laughs> okay, so that's what happened. And uh, today's Balmer B story, um, uh, it just well, it is what it is. It's based on, um, you know, we've had a lot of Clay Davis this season, and I feel like it's gotten the short shrift on the show because Clay Davis, um, is a great character and whatnot, but it's always, it's, it feels like this very much like a siloed side story. Mm-hmm. But this is the culmination of this season's Clay Davis stuff, uh, where Bond. You know, he puts him on trial and it's uh, attorney. Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out uh, it does not go the way he wanted. No, and Clay Davis turns out. That's right. And he's he got, plays the race card. That. Oh, yeah. The, Hard. the race card is played, which is why this song is the Ace of Spades by Motorhead. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Bondy took a gamble just to get his man. You win some, lose some at the grand jury. <laughs> at the grand jury, is what I said. He wanted to catch clay, but ego got in the way. Why are 507? The fuck did I do? Alright, I'm just gonna play you my favorite the part. Well, it's almost done. Clay Davis is like she in the race car plane. The race car plane. <laughs> This is, this is my favorite part. <laughs> Bond and Rhonda lose, and Clay's back in the news. But that's the way I like it, baby. I really like the wires. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. You know, oh, oh. I, I really, did, I really mm. did a spit take. Oh. Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, you know. That one was a, that was a lot of fun, but goddamn, if I if I am choosing ones that are hurting my throat, I did Tool last week. Oh yeah. shit! Yeah, that one hurt a lot. Um, but yes, Clay plays not just the race card, but the whole deck. The whole deck, to, yeah. Jokers, everything, the instruction, mm-hmm. the little instruction, yeah, the instruction card, <laughs> yeah. yeah, all the, fifty the, the holder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about this episode. A lot happens. I mean, we've got uh, more and more of 
McNulty's plan is coming to fruition in ways that are both good and scary for him. We have Omar. He's on the war path. He's trying to find Marlo, but he's doing so by putting his name on the street. Um, and we have Kima trying to build furniture. Uh, Vince, <laughs> tell me, what did you think of this episode? Okay, so I'm going to go back to um, the unfair criticism. I think a lot of the reason that this episode feels not as good is because we know that the end is coming that we know that there's only three more episodes and like Mm. when you know that there's only three more episodes it's like you uh there's more pressure on the show like everything that it does that is not a thing that you want to happen you're like ah shit it's wasting time you're (laughs) wasting time we're not going to get to the stuff that i want to happen and i think another thing about this episode is that uh, it's dealing a lot with the fake serial killer, which is a thing that's right. not really happening. So you're kind of right. you're wanting, this is an episode about a misdirect. So you're kind of mm. wanting them to stop the faint and get back to like, all right, but what's happening with Marlo? What's happening? Right. You know, there's a little bit of Omar and Marlo, but we don't even really see, we don't see Marlo, Chris, or episode. Snoop this yeah. entire episode. So you're like, where, where are they? Like, don't hide them from me when we only have yeah. three yeah. episodes left. And all that being said, like there are some things in this that I've remembered from, you know, whatever my last rewatch was eight years ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like the scene where Gus is talking about uh, Scotty Templeton getting took like that. Yeah. That to me is like in the wire canon. It's like one of those things that's like, yes, seared into my brain, that sort of little conversation where he's putting it together, where he's like, this guy doesn't even, this guy's working this hard just to avoid a correction. Like what else has he done? Like, that's a great scene. That's, that's kind of the only reason reason why I'll even entertain the serial killer storylines because I want to see this Tom McCarthy character get his come up and, you know, like, fuck this guy. Yeah, 100%. He he makes me so uncomfortable, that guy. (laughs) Yeah, he did. From his first appearance on screen, like... He's he's Weasley from Jump. You look at him and you're like, I I fucking hate this guy. Yes, yes. And they... I thought they did a great job writing for him just because, yeah. and he did a great job portraying him. Um, the look, the acting, the writing, like he's a, he's like a definitive uh, weasel journalist. And I so think. the only, the only thing I like about that serial killer storyline is like one, it does build up to a point where it's like, Oh, is McNulty finally going to get caught? But here mm-hmm. where McNulty goes down to the Baltimore sun and questions, uh, the Tom Scott, McCarthy no. character Scott yeah. he, he questions him about the serial killer call and and fucking and you just want you just want this fucking reporter to get caught yeah and yeah. I, yeah, I think that's part of why it feels less enjoyable because we know the show's ending and like this is a show mm-hmm. that's not about good things happening like it would have been a cheat if you know they fixed right. they fixed of Baltimore course. and yeah. the drug yeah. war yeah. and did you know that's not going to happen but i think in every other season because uh, because you know that the characters go on and the show goes on, like it does right. give you like these grains of hope for a right. happy ending yes. for certain people. Whereas yes. this, it's like, you know, McNulty is going to go down over this. Clay right. Davis has not gone down over this. Right. Omar, something bad is going to happen. Like everything about this episode, like every storyline is like impending doom. And yeah, it's totally. hard to like, re- it's hard to root for impending doom. Yeah. <laughs> Good call. Even if yeah. it's like totally true to the story and i think it is true to the story which is why the wire's great but it like it's hard you can't you can't root for impending doom it's tough yeah yeah uh uh, tell me brendan did you did you like this episode what what were your thoughts your general thoughts on this episode i i mean i really to me it really was about scott templeton fucking just getting caught and like even like he gets a call from the serial killer he has a meeting with the police and Mm -hmm. the editorial board and gus is in there in the room with him and gus is still not buying it or he's buying it but reluctantly Mm -hmm. yes like that's how fucking good gus is at his job like he can smell shit from a mile away 100 percent. and he knows 
it's just not right. And he walks out exasperated at the end of that scene and saying, I, I guess I'm wrong or something yeah. like that. But it's just, so I, you know, knowing that there's no justice in the world and knowing that there's no justice in the world of the wire. Yeah. Like, I just want vengeance from time <laughs> to time and it to be exacted on one single human being here and there. And Scott Templeton is that, your guy. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like he's that, in my sights. Yeah. I feel like that explains like the entire political climate of the U S <laughs> right oh, now. Yeah. Where totally. It's like both sides oh, yeah. are like, we don't expect expect anything good to happen the best we can hope for is that something bad happens to someone that we don't like totally. right yeah, yeah 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 i i i think it and that's on both sides of the aisle i oh I sure think actually you know like the left is pretty ineffective at forcing yeah. systematic change you know um, yeah. Change yeah yeah on yeah so it's just like we, level so it's like what can we do on an individual basis and it's like oh we could tear this fucker down yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and <laughs> yeah. it's not even it doesn't even have to be like like we don't expect any kind of like uh legal or some sort of systemic justice to happen right. but if we find out that like yeah, Mitch McConnell gets hit by a car. We're just yes. like, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like people will have a barbecue. There'll be some balloons, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like we, the, the, that, And that's all we can get. That's yes. what gets us by to the next day. It's that Literally, little bit that's of joy we got from The only thing you can expect death. is, yeah, is, is <laughs> that eventually someone will die. <laughs> and you just hope you don't die first. <laughs> but that's, that's yeah. very much like I'm just like going to live wire. out of spite. How about Yes. I mean, listen, I've said this before about The Wire. The show is mostly about spite as a motivator um, and you know, watching the show and waiting for someone to get come up. And, you know, right yeah. now it's like you're waiting for Marlo or Scott to get their come up yes. because those are characters that we do not like. But we right. also know that this is not a show that gives you what you want. Um <laughs> Yeah, I, I felt like this was the first episode um, that I found myself have like just to do the fucking Balmer B story. I was like, what am I going to do it about? And I was like, I don't really remember what happened. Came right? a putty together in yeah. Ikea, your desk. No. <laughs> yeah, I know. You should have like, sung it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it's like I get it from a writing standpoint. You're like, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of funny. And it's a then, callback to McNulty putting together an Ikea desk. It's, and it, uh, she's it also now feels like McNulty. one of those yeah. bad infomercials where like the person like is yeah. really overdoing how hard it is to yeah. like open a milk carton right, or some right, shit. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're like, yeah. Okay, we're not that. Inept. But it's it, it it's it is still something that has some of my favorite, um, like very memorable moments, and that includes this opening. Um, the cold open of this episode is McNulty doing a prank phone call, uh, pretending right. to be the uh, you know the serial killer, um, and uh, you know I I have a clip of that for uh, everyone to you know see and um, enjoy. Tight, tight, tight. Templeton. Christ. <laughs> I was a... I was him. <laughs> Again. So anyways, yeah, he calls him and he pretends that he kicked his dog. Um, no, he, call, he calls him and pretends to be uh, the ki killer. And he uh, he gets a compliment on his Balmer accent, which, by the way... Was awful. Was, it was awful. He didn't even do a Balmer accent. Well, he, yeah, I feel like there's levels of that. Like, the like, what's the subtext? It's like, wow, you did a really good Balmer accent. And then the subtext is like, what the fuck accent have you been doing for the rest of this <laughs> yeah, series? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then there's a double subtext to that, which is that McNulty directed this episode. So oh, did it's he like, really? Oh, yeah, is that awesome. like a self-directing, uh, a self-deprecating uh, joke that he's doing? Definitely. There? There was de it was 100%. definitely a writer's room thing because yes. he's... The actor's from the UK. And yeah, 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 yeah. He's from the UK, and he is not... Uh, th there are seasons where he's not even trying. Like, the, the fact that there's so yeah. many takes that you... Because, you know, they they had him, like, slip up multiple times. You watch it in the show, and it's like... They do many takes on TV shows. I know that <laughs> for a fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know how TV work. And uh, <laughs> it was like, that was the closest they got. Uh, which just says a lot. We're still going to fix it in post anyway. Yeah, we'll fix it in post. Now it'll be AI. But um, 
Yeah. So it is, uh, there's a, a lot of storylines we could start with. I think, um, let's go the, to that one. Let's do that one. Nick McNulty well, making the call as his serial yeah. killer. So, so yeah, it, we got Lester Freeman. He's, he gives like a very brief explanation of how he's going to call using his number spoofing software. Right. And, mm-hmm. and McNulty's just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And as, as a viewer, we're like, yeah, I have no idea what you're yeah, talking know. about either. And I kind of feel like it's the wire. You could have gone a little more specific on that. We would have been, we would have been interested to hear something like very process based about how you actually Maybe. do that. I think mm. I was fine. Then, I was fine. I got it. I, yeah, it was, was like, fine. I, yeah. So then, so then McNulty, he's, you know, he's chewing gum cause he's trying to make his voice unrecognizable. Right. He's doing the, he's doing the accent. And then Lester tells him stick to the script, which is a funny line in light of what comes next where it's like, yes. Oh, you wrote all that down about his riff about Mac daddy. Crack Mac daddy. Yeah, he calls him a whack Mac daddy. daddy, daddy. Yeah. Whack daddy. <laughs> Was he just reading all those things? Who wrote the script? Did he write it on a typewriter? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a, a Word document? Yeah, doing his little hunt and peck like we know that McNulty does when he types. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, you know, it's clearly this is the part of the plan is to get, uh, you know, Phelan uh, to OK a wiretap that includes picture messages and stuff. And um, so as soon as. Uh, they hang up all of a sudden like the police have geared up and you see kind of like Sidner is in the area like directing the call basically he's uh, using that cell phone somehow through some technology to like it sends a signal there so all the police will come there right Mm -hmm. Um, and but I think what he doesn't expect is the fact that like um, now everyone in the surrounding area is just going to get brutalized. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Lawsuit. Hey, come over here. This guy's on a phone. Yeah, he's got, get him. He's got a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like three words out of that cop's mouth. You're like, oh, she's really from Baltimore. Oh, yeah. yeah they're from nah, Baltimore. She's definitely from the um, neighborhood. But yeah, it's like uh, the, the collateral damage uh, that is done from this giant feign, uh, this fake serial killer like plan is I think kind of apparent in this episode more than any others. Cause they also have Kima at one point interviewing a family um, whose son died in the streets of one of the homeless who was killed by this serial killer, quote unquote. And uh, it's just so sad. Cause you're just like, Oh yeah, that's right. Now, <laughs> Now these people are, aren't just dealing with the death of their loved one. Yeah. Uh, they're dealing with the fact that they kicked him out because he was an addict, which is a thing that does happen. Um, right. You know, eventually you stop uh, enabling someone. And then instead of him dying of an OD, the way, you know, you kind of expect, <laughs> you find out that he's been like sexually bitten to death by a weirdo <laughs> serial killer. It's like, oh, See, right. That, I, like I that, but writing wise, like I feel like that is one that was one storyline where the fake storyline panned out in something real. Like yes. they used the fake some storyline to get to some real stories that right. they were telling. And yes. that was great. And then we got like 10 minutes of her putting together a fucking <laughs> Ikea desk. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I feel like this was, this was kind of funny. Maybe a couple minutes of that would have been okay. And you, you went yeah. overboard. A little no, bit. I want more. <laughs> Give me more of that. <laughs> you um, gotta see her struggle with the you, instruction manual. Like yeah, you gotta see her throw and shit. Yeah, yeah. She she unravels it and she gets caught up in it. Yeah, <laughs> she's pushing it. I actually have clips of that, but I won't play it because I know Vince will get mad. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. What did you do? Did you? I did, no, I did nothing to oh, it. Okay, I just right. was like, hey, you guys remember this? Um, <laughs> Uh, But yeah, so like uh, McNulty is getting, you know, now finally he's getting people um, like he's getting City Hall engaged and actually pouring money into this case. So his plan of stealing a a man from the street and then sending a picture of that man to the paper has worked out um, timing wise perfectly because at this point, Mayor Carcetti is like a fundraising machine. Mm-hmm. Right. You see him, you know, like laying back. He's getting people to like 92, max out. I think is the number. And that yes. was a great, this was a great storyline. Like the, I mean, like Carcetti was never like a, a good guy necessarily, no. but he goes from hating cold calls to, you to know, loving, loving them because he's so good them. at them. Yeah. yeah. And he's getting his ego fluffed every time. Uh, that he does it. 
And yeah, uh, yeah, you see him become the politician, sort of like fully, oh, yeah. fully realized, as opposed to trying to be the reformer. He's no right, longer yes. trying you, to you, be the reformer. He's, yeah, he can know. I mean, before he could separate the political from the reform things that he wanted to do, maybe. And like right. by this point, it's like he's he's blurred those lines for himself. Like he cannot yes. see out of that anymore. Right. Yeah, he actually, it's it, you know, it it happens pretty slowly based on you know the fact that he is brought in i think first season three and his transformation from season three to now like at this point he has fully accepted this uh excuse in his head with yes i'm going to let the city of baltimore suffer now in all these different ways but it's for the greater good of me being the governor someday right, yeah. <laughs> and it's and everything that bad that happens to Baltimore it's always about how it affects his campaign yes it's how not it about how it affects the people of Baltimore yes like he, the moment when he finds out uh that the <clears throat> serial killer has struck again it's like this moment of like pure joy right before where he's just like right yeah, people a lot of people want me to be mayor I'm fucking I, or they want me to be governor that's what they want and then Norman comes in and he's like the serial killer struck again sent a picture to the times uh, or sent a picture to the Baltimore Sun and he's just like fuck no <laughs> and he's like you know get me Rawls like and he's not mad because like a guy is missing he's mad because he's like no I was just feeling good about my chances to right. you know gain um, <laughs> he's become an effective altruist at this point I believe you know, yes, he the, is. You know, he's yeah, he's the he's same. Like, I gotta Bankman collect, Freed of Baltimore. I gotta collect all this money in goodwill so that That's, I can do something for society at some that indeterminate is date in the, in the future. The, this is proto effective altruism. You know, this. Yeah, I gotta become a billionaire, then I'll help you. Um, but uh, yeah, so he's uh, finally, you know, he's letting the faucet open. He's mm-hmm. opening up the faucet. Mm-hmm. He's the faucet like, uh, is gaping. The, yeah, the faucet <laughs> is gaping and pulsating money. And it is uh, hot. We're talking a straight prolapse at this point. Everybody getting paid. And uh, and yeah, McNulty is stuck in this weird position where um, the downside of this is that now people are treating it like a real ser- serial killer. Um, which means that people are giving him resources that he absolutely does not need in order right. to catch this person. And like people are being pulled off their cases. Like Kima has a triple murder that she was working. Um, and now she's going off to interview family members, of, you know, to basically watch them and be sad with them as they tell a story that didn't actually happen that they don't know. Um, and, uh, and also, I really love uh, the moment. Bunk has one of my favorite lines in this where, uh, here, I'll just play. <laughs> awesome. Well, how, like, that laugh is so good. He yeah. had an effect and presence off screen. Oh, like, yeah. They were so the, good. He, I mean, this, yeah. I feel he like. He didn't even it, have to say that line. No, like, he, he didn't. He said it in the laugh. Exactly. You know, it, yes. But the line is just a. Cherry it's on the top. cherry on top. Yeah, yeah, this feels like a bunk episode. I mean, the whole like if mm. you're talking about who like gets the the best lines and the best scenes, it's for mm. sure a bunk episode. Yeah, bunk bunk is uh, he's doing his best to be the uh, you know the good cop, and again, he's the good cop at this point out of spite. Uh, like, yeah, he it mostly. I mean, he's is, the voice of reason. He is. He he is the only one who's reasonable here. He kind of almost represents the audience in a way where they're just going, right. this is such a stupid plan. It's the last season of The Wire, man. Why are you <laughs> doing this? <laughs> like, just, you you were you were going so good for so long. And, um, you know, uh, and he has decided that he's going to be, you know, catching these um murders the old-fashioned way right uh which is like through police work but it's like this is police yeah. work that i feel like he, he wouldn't is have... also just gonna power through it's, yeah, it's exactly. police work that he wouldn't have done if he wasn't spiteful and it's also yes, like absolutely yes yeah. he'd be yes. drunk right now if... right yeah. and it's yeah. also you can say he's the voice of reason for like urging uh you know caution for for mcnulty's job but it's not like he's it's not like his plan would result in a better outcome. Like he, no, no, exactly. He like doesn't he, really, he's maintaining a status quo that we've already discovered. Like doesn't is care. Shitty. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But he does happen because of the spite uh, to stumble upon something that right. is going to right. bear fruit later. Mm-hmm. So he, um, he gets mm, bear fruit. 
Mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, what? <laughs> Sorry. <go ahead. laughs> he likes uh, so he he's looking through Michael's stepdad's case file and um, he decides to bring in Michael Lee to uh, to talk to him about the murder of his uh, stepfather. And, um, it, you know, it, he that scene he doesn't get anything from michael um but you know he's on the right track because as it turns out yes uh, chris actually did um you know do this murder and that is going to be the thing that um i think uh, gets chris behind bars um and but meanwhile what he's waiting on is some dna from the crime lab uh to be right analyze but of course it's not yet been analyzed because they're working on a fake serial killer which uh you know but they also mixed up all the blood samples they did they mixed up all the (laughs) blood samples because of a temp um but mcnulty uh despite all those people were innocent but then some temp came and yeah yeah exactly that's (laughs) really what happened yeah yeah the temp came in and then just said hey what are we sabotaged it on that's right um and then uh, McNulty, while he has to deal with that, uh, you know, ancillary issue, uh, people trying to get him to go to Quantico <laughs> and stuff. He is also dealing with the fact that everybody knows he's a money man now. Yeah. And uh, this is just a, a collection of the moments in which McNulty is being magnanimous. <laughs> uh, totally. And, uh, He's good. <laughs> good line. Him realizing that he is now a boss is, I think, one of my favorite parts of this uh, episode. Is just the now he is stuck in this position where um, a position he was almost relishing at one point. Yeah, I mean, he liked the position of being the guy who's going to give you know give out money, you know, hide stuff in his uh, yeah in this case file. He wants but, to be important, we but he to. also is someone who has just, I think almost like a DNA level aversion to bosses. Like he just hates right. bosses on yes. principle. Yes. He has some sort of it's DSM a, disorder. Probably. Yes. He's got <laughs> oppositional defiance about. disorder go, that one. for He's bosses. Odd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for any job he has, which, you know, listen, if you don't have that, then you're not normal in my opinion. Yes. Yeah, you're I a think. cop. You're, you're a cop. Yeah, you're a cop. Exactly. I mean, you know, yes, he's a. Oh, hey, speaking hey, of cops. What, what does this mean? We have to wrap the, it up? Yeah, I'm the, yeah, I'm the cop. And uh, you guys are too loud. So I'm going to have to shut this down. No, but I am <laughs> so, the, I'm sort of the advertising cop. We got to turn on the money fountain. Let's do oh, it. Make, make that spigot flow. Let's spigot. Open up that faucet. Like what, what's that in the background? What am I hearing? Oh, they're like renovating the apartment next door. <laughs> oh, I thought God. it was like whales or something. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I, just, oh, I thought I heard Vince's mom. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, come on. <laughs> Well, it is time to take a quick commercial break. Uh, so stick around. <laughs> and we will be right back. Shut up, Vince's mom. And we're back. Um, so we're talking about McNulty being the boss. You did uh, skip over my favorite line of this episode in that sequence, oh, yeah? which is another bunk line. I mean, just bunk being in the room while while Jimmy doles out favors yes. and patronage yeah. is uh, excellent. Best part of the episode. And there's one line in there where he says, well, ain't you the little king of diamonds? Yeah. There you yeah. go. Yeah. There you go. That was Great. very good. Great I line. mean, like McNulty I actually is, think that's a hard line to deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it's, it's quaint. It's, it's yeah. antiquated, but like, yes. I, you know, Wendell Pierce, he's probably the only one who could deliver that. Right. Really. Like you yeah. can imagine David Simon writing that, but you 100%. can't imagine like many actors nailing that. And uh, yeah, Wendell Pierce, one of the few that. Yes. Like in a book, it works. I think, mm-hmm. yes. you know, like, okay, they created this world and, people have a particular language but yeah yeah it is it is i think no cop with an ulcer is going to talk like that right and i, I think <laughs> unless it's like, he played lacrosse in high school right <laughs> <laughs> well there's like there's a few characters who i feel like 
can deliver those like fancy boy David Simon lines. Yeah. Uh, and it's Landsman like being Jay being Jay Landsman and Who's Landsman? Uh, Landsman is uh his played by Delaney Williams. He's like the, um, the fat guy. The, the fat guy, the real oh, real, real, oh, real fat guy. Amazing. Like he he's great at delivering um yes. just a string of David Simon esque insults and while swears. While reading Jugs magazine or while, eating, yes, while reading a, a Jugs fish. and eating a full sandwich that's mostly yeah. mustard. Um and <laughs> just like just saying the most yeah antiquated uh string of swears you've ever heard it's like he has that danny houston uh f murray abram uh, thing where it's like they can only play theatrical characters but they yes, make 100%. you believe it because you're like oh well sometimes you meet a theater sometimes, kid in real yeah. life and yeah, like yeah, they just 100%. play those people yeah sometimes these guys exist yeah um but yeah is omar the other one I mean, Omar for sure. Yeah. Omar yeah. is is someone who is he's such like, a, a he's fantasy with poetry character. for sure. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. definitely a comic book one hundred percent figure. Yeah. Yes, he's a superhero. He's a comic book uh, character. He's uh, he's the one you will suspend disbelief um, and watch him do all sorts of stuff. Which in uh, this episode is interesting because he is continuing. His uh, rampage, uh, trying to get Marlo out into the street. So you see him. Um, well, you don't see him. You see a, a stash house that's been um, shot up and had all the drugs flushed down the toilet. Um, <clears throat> and you see him uh, talking to Savino. This is the first time. Out of I've spite. Seen... Again, out of spite. <laughs> yeah. He so just... norm- this dude normally makes his living robbing the drug dealers. But no, this is personal now. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yes. This is like for him, he's going the full show, Joker the, mode. This episode should have been called Spite. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, most episodes I feel like should have been called Spite. <laughs> um, but uh, there's this great moment um, where we see Savino for the first time in a while. We haven't seen him since his Barksdale days. And, uh, yeah. you know, he's at this point, Omar's been letting people live just to send a message, like tell right. Marlo he's a bitch and that his mom's yeah, a whale point. and stuff. Um, but he decides not to. And, um, I think I have a clip, uh, for everyone that I think everyone, uh, will very much enjoy. There. Well, I know who was there. What you was going to do if he was there, huh? We don't need that. You know what, yo? What the hell? <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Shout out. It's a little Empire Records shout out. I just <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I edited it. That was yeah, funny. I, I edited it in and stuff. <laughs> I like to, you know, mm-hmm. I like to do edits, Brendan. That's the sound of you patting yourself. That's on the me back. patting myself on the back. Cause no one else pats it. Um yeah, so Omar is going through, he's killing Savino. Everyone at the record store saw it. Um, the lighting by the with the strip club in the background is beautiful. Right? Yeah, this that is, is really it, incredible. And there's very, even a moment where the lights in the background are green, like a neon mm-hmm. yellowish green, and Savino's in like neon yellowish greens. Yeah. Oh, fucking yeah. incredible composition. Yeah, I mean, I think this show really. If there's one thing you can say about the fifth season, at the very least, uh, you know compare it to the composition and the shots in the first season. And you're like, Oh yeah, they, they, it's like they learned how to make a, a show where they got they a budget. They were allowed they, to wet down the streets at night. Like, yeah. They got a budget. And, and they were also like, I feel like um, they were trying to do something in the first season where it was almost like th- there was a lot more hand cam. There was a lot yes. more like yes. kind of shaky, you yes. know, this feeling of almost doc style. NYPD blue or whatever. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They, they talked about that in the book where like that was, yeah. that was like their, that was like their plan was to shoot all the, like the slum scenes, like in handheld right. uh, camera. And then they sort of dropped that. Like Robert. Colbert. It's actually like, way yeah, more, need- it's actually way more tense that it's still. Yes. A hundred percent. And uh, moving actually like would have taken the tension out of it. Yeah, yeah I have a the whole, fact like, that I, the, yeah. the movements are uh, slow and smooth actually makes it more tense instead right. of having it be janky and jarring. 
Yeah, that's kind of like my bugaboo lately mm. is that uh, every action movie, like they're trying to impress you with how many camera moves they make. And you're like, yeah. dude, just hold like you have the best fight choreographers and stuntmen right. in the world doing cool yeah. stuff. And you're going to make me like watch it through your shitty swoopy, like moving steady cam bullshit. Like just put the camera still and let them do what they do so we can enjoy it. But no, it's always, it's like a, it's I'm like a cam, camera yeah. move dick yeah. measuring thing. And I fucking hate it. Yeah. Yeah. Also like uh, at this point, you know, I am, it, it's almost like, kind of brilliant that they dropped it because of the fact that that mm-hmm. became a, th- a thing you would see in everything like there was a and certain point the, where every who's show the guy had who to have directed friday night lights who's the actor who's now like peter berg to, peter berg it's kind yeah. of his fault like he, yeah well yeah. it's also it's like if you're because he the, per, he presented it to like a mainstream audience first right yeah he, he but popularized also, it but also like in the wire if like the whole thing they're doing is trying to like present these parallels like in this episode they have cross cutting between the newsroom and the police station and like the whole season they've been trying to like make these yes make the like establish the symmetry between the drug world and the police world like why would you shoot them differently, differently. if you're right. trying 100%. to right like, yeah i don't know yeah. And, and it just, it, it was, it, it was catchy and just not, um, I think it was based on it was a some white people shit. It was, it was some yeah. white people no, shit. But straight up. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. It was white yeah. people shit. And even, you know, even if they had someone behind the camera, it's still like, you know, the higher up aesthetics, the higher ups with, you know, we're saying like, we got to make this edgy and this is how you present yes. edginess. Mm-hmm. We got to tell white people what gritty, like being on the streets yeah, is like, yeah. it's gritty, right. it's yeah, scary. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on the okay. streets, even the cameraman's on crack. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's very annoying. And I'm glad that they dropped that. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a beautiful season to look at. Um, but uh, moving on also, uh, Omar, you know, he yeah, but Omar finally, like he fucking shoots a video. He murders yeah. him in cold blood. And he, he says, you know what, Sabina. fuck it. Because he, the thing Omar said to him was kind of beautiful. It's like, yeah, you weren't there. But if you were there, what were you going to do? Back out and not right, shoot yeah. Butchie? Like, yeah. He knows exactly what this now. guy is about. And th- I think the thing with uh, Omar at that moment, he also was just like, I'm, you know, th- at this point, I've told enough guys that Omar's a bitch. And <laughs> Savino <laughs> right. is a heartless prick and has no code. I'm just going to shoot this guy. Yeah. Yeah, which I feel like for the actor who played Savino, when he found out he was like coming back for season five, he was probably like, fuck yeah. And then he read the scene. He was like, God damn it. (laughs) But if you're going to get killed by anyone on the show, I think it's an honor to get killed by Omar. Right, get killed by Um, Omar. Omar then, uh, he goes up to Michael's crew uh, and Mm -hmm. once again is like, by the way, Marlo's a bitch. Um, And... (laughs) The the first time and the first character ever on this show to see Omar with different eyes is Kennard. Yes. Kennard sees him and is just like, that's Omar? And, he, and then he calls yeah. him gimpy as a motherfucker. <laughs> and it's funny because you see everyone else is like frozen in fear and they're right. like relieved when he leaves, but they're still like, they're all shitting themselves except for Kennard. Cause Kennard is just like, Oh, he's just a guy. Mm-hmm. He's just some guy. And, and not only that, but he's a guy who's limping. Like yes. what are we, why are we scared of this guy? He's on like, his last leg. Literally. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, it's funny, you know, like how much, um, you know, the, the, the show is known for its verisimilitude, except for Omar with Omar. You just, you, you allow him to be Omar because he's so fucking cool. And, um, I think one of the reasons that, um, people, uh, hated this season is because they dropped that, uh, and yeah, he the, was vulnerable all of a sudden. Yeah. 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 They dropped that. And then, um, and they turned well, him into a cold blooded killer. I mean, he was all along, but you like. Were, I mean, he wasn't cold blooded. I feel like everything he, he yeah, he did right. It was, was always in a gun battle, and now they we cross yeah. the Rubicon here, and that's kind of a tell that you know he's going to die because that yes. happened. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's invincible before, and now he's vulnerable. It's really, you know, it's yeah, it's yeah. he's repulsive to look at. Actually, like yeah. he's not even limping on a proper crutch. He's limping yeah. on a broomstick. <laughs> Yeah, that you know, a 
crutch that he made himself he fabricated out of the broom closet and yeah so it's it's not pretty it's, to look at at all yeah and it's like it's cool that he's doing the joker thing where he's just like right. uh, some people just want to watch the world burn he's burning all the money and stuff like but at the same time you see where this is all going and you you just know that uh you know the show's about to end and this isn't going anywhere good <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, yeah, so moving on um, in terms of the uh, storyline for the newspapers, uh, you talked earlier about um, just some of the Gus stuff. uh, And this is like one of my favorite Gus episodes because Mm. this is finally Gus is getting to the bottom of all of his bullshit. And he is like. He is so mad about what's happening with Scott because like you guys were saying, like in that scene where, you know, obviously, you know, he's, he, he was there. He watched him get this call. The police come over and say, yes, you got this call. It was from the serial killer. And Gus is still like, this doesn't make any fucking yeah, sense. It doesn't sit right with him. <laughs> yes. And yeah. um, you just watch. I was him. talking to him. Yeah. Again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, again. That was great. And, and then it was just like uh d- did he sound the same? What do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah. Like from the first time. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But oh, he, I he had a meant... bunch more accent. Yeah, no. Yeah, no, but yeah, but different. And like Gus is smelling the the bullshit on all this and I love him complaining to his editors um or his bosses about scott's piece um yeah because he just is like but he presents it in a professional manner and it's a journalistic grievance and yeah it's it's Uh, not out of petty human envy it feels real because it's like that is the way that you smell a rat in those situations because it's Mm -hmm. like he he had carte blanche to put himself into the story and do a first person piece and he still had to like gild it like he still had to right exaggerate how much danger yeah. he was in exaggerate yeah. how long he actually spent with them and yeah. the same thing with like getting took it was you know it was that woman who he made up this whole story about uh mistaken identity just to avoid admitting that like oh yeah my source your source lies to you sometimes like no. you, that, like, like it's it, unavoidable i feel like that's just such a it was such a great way to depict that because it's not yeah. it's not like the huge lies it's like the it's the pointless Ooh. lies where yeah. it's like there's I, not I, a ton of upside see. in this there you go the bar scene that's yeah, what i want yeah. are you gonna show this because yeah i'm gonna show the bar yes, scene please. and that's so perfect because you're seeing uh gus putting all the pieces together it's like when you find out that someone you know is like full of shit and then you go oh yeah like yeah we, we've all uh i think known people uh who just were pathological liars like they just couldn't help themselves um but i think the the difference is like finding out someone has just been making shit up like to me there's nothing more embarrassing than that i would almost if i found out someone i knew was like lying about something big i would just never say anything about it ever I, and I, I would live with that lie with them. That's how but that's how pathological liars get by. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. they know people don't want to get took. Like, yeah, they know there's embarrassment and shame involved. Yeah. And in, in being took the first time. And they know you don't want to say anything about it. It's how scammers operate. They yeah. Love it's, on that. it's that and the the bullshit asymmetry principle or whatever it's called where it's like it Mm. takes them so much less work to make up some shit than it takes you (laughs) to prove that they're bullshitting because you have to be all even handed and like give the benefit of doubt over this and that but they just say it and then you have to do all the work right yeah you just you you have to be the one who it's like like, that quote attributed to churchill whatever it's like the truth the lie travels around the world three times while the Oh Truth yeah, still pulling on its boots or some shit. Yeah, I mean, listen, I I don't I know a lot of Churchill quotes, so I knew that one immediately. Yeah, yeah. Before I even uttered, I'm it. not even a liar. I don't even lie about. <laughs> you don't even lie about lying. I, I don't even lie about lying. Um, I like that Gus is reluctant to to. He's call like him he's out. still a journalistic professional. Like he's yes. still a journalist in his 
heart and his soul and his bones and he's like i don't want to call another reporter a liar like yeah well, even though he knows yeah. yeah even though he knows yeah well, he's, he's also he's, in the position of he knows his bosses just think he's a hater so he's like, right and, and it's i like, mean he is the great white hope and he knows right he has this uphill battle yeah yeah and and the thing is is like he is kind of a hater but like within reason, it's like it's all justified. It's yeah. super justified. It's very and, but reasonable. But the way he justifies it is justified. Like I'm saying, it's yes. not a personal attack. Like it yeah. still comes from being a reporter. And like, he is investigating him from right. both a, a, a feeling of like, I feel like this guy is lying and a little bit because he's a hater. Because he's just like, <laughs> also, this guy fucking sucks and he's thirsty and like... Mm -hmm. And, you know, like right. he is, he is also a fucking tattletale. Like he's like being lazy and he's lazy. He's lazy. And, thinks and he's he, better than he is. Yes. And he, and he, uh, he's impatient and he's ambitious to a fault. And he's, uh, you know, he, at one point was like, you know, when the editors came over, when, uh, Gus didn't like some other piece, um, I think it was the one about like the kid in the wheelchair, right. um, you know, he's writing about the opening day at uh, the Orioles stadium. And, you know, Gus uh, was like, this sucks. And we can't prove that this kid exists. And then his bosses come over and they're like, great work, Scott. And he's like, yeah, well, I don't think other people think so. And it's like, you <laughs> yeah. fucking bitch. Yeah. Like you're going to snitch just like that. And well, they're forcing, they're forcing Gus to be objective about, uh, yeah. to find an objective truth in something that he already knows is emotionally right. true. And yeah. like, He's kind of annoyed with the bosses because, like, they should be cynical enough to well, that's see. the job because it's like yes. you don't notice it because you know the truth. You notice it because the writing's bad, and it's like their yeah. job to notice when writing is bad, but they don't because even they, the you know. even the Washington Post pointed that out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're like, oh, this kind of sucks for us, but I could see how. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Gus is putting all the pieces together and we'll see where that goes. Finally, Clay Davis. Um, this storyline I felt, and I felt this way the entire season was this storyline suffered from there being this limited run, like this being the shortest season. Right. Yeah. Um, this also being the last season, which I think it's clear that they knew because um, of the way the show kind of like ends with the fucking season one theme song and all that stuff. Um, so because of that, a lot happens um, in a short amount of time with this Clay Davis story. And this is a story that I feel like would have had it had time to breathe, yes. would have maybe felt like not such a narrative leap. Like we weren't like uh, almost it's almost not relevant. Mm -hmm. um, and like it would have come back, uh, like they would have found a way to make it relevant, but yes, like in having yes. to rush to a finish line, it's like yeah, two it's, more episodes. Season needed yeah. two more episodes. It also, yeah, yeah, it just sort of happens too fast. Like there's like the the yeah. big build up that they're gonna get this guy, and then one day in court, and he's out, and yeah, so it's right. Over. Yes, yes, one day in court, and then also like as a viewer, you're kind of like, well, we've seen this like you know this prolonged grand jury thing. Um, we we see. Um, all of this work that Freeman and Sidner had been doing up until that point to like follow the money and stuff. Um, and to have it all kind of like happen in this one episode feels like they did the storyline a bit of, of a disservice. That being said, it has some of my fucking favorite <laughs> moments of Clay Davis, <laughs> like him going on the steps of the courthouse <laughs> Uh, and like the way he talks to the press in this way that like for the white people there, yeah. they're just like, get a load of this guy. How do you guys believe a word this guy says? <laughs> yeah. But you see that there's a, a clearly a cultural uh, disconnect where people um, like who are white are just like, what? This guy is like very much a criminal and the rest of the community is like fuck yeah this guy is about this guy is for us and Damn right, this is a criminal uh, yeah and, and i feel like this obviously is not um you know this is not just a, a for it's not like white people can see i mean white people also get tricked by people like carchetti or by people like donald trump you know we are also fall for charlatans all the time but uh well, who's, just, the, who's the white guy who's the developer developing the harbor in the uh show? andy project yeah yeah, yeah. 
I mean, yeah, Crosscheck I mean, was in cahoots with Clay Davis. Like. Yeah, I mean, all these people, they, they all see him as a useful, you know, tool for their own, you know, little villainous scams. Um, but uh, this is like, this is just wonderful watching him work. Like, I, I think this is the first time, you know, is this season when you see him talking to his constituents and like, um, you know, talking to the media and realizing like, oh, this guy is smooth as fuck. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. He um, fucking lays it on thick. Yeah, he lays it on so thick. And uh, I uh, I have a clip of him on the courthouse steps with just all of the best malapropisms. <laughs> it is so good. Here it is. I mean, for Rhonda and Bond, it's like clear that this is not going their way. And the best part They're getting is, fucking steamrolled, man. Dude, like, and Clay really, he puts on the performance of a lifetime. And it is so funny watching. He's Barnum and Bailey. All yes, in one. yes. Well, we got to credit Bill Murphy, the guy who plays uh, Clay lawyer? Davis's lawyer, who's oh, an actual great. lawyer. Like, he's not an actor, but yeah, you wouldn't, I, you wouldn't I, know it. I, I thought he was a lawyer. I was like, this dude's way too fucking slick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I don't know. There's other people in the show where you're like, oh, well, this person's not an actor because they're not good at acting. Right. right. They're, or they're not slick. They seem gruff. Yeah. 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 But this like guy. The other guy, like the former chief of police guy who plays the yes. other, who plays Detective Norris. Like, yeah. you know, he's not an actor because he says his lines too fast. And he right. like. He's not uh, good at acting. Yeah. 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 But this Boys, guy. Yeah. Is not this guy who went on to like represent Freddie Gray? Like he, right. he, he did it well. I didn't like, know that. I didn't know he yeah. Yeah. went on to represent Freddie Gray. Good for yeah, him. yeah. And it's interesting too because he's playing like such a slimeball character, and uh, you know, it's like uh, I don't know. I, I guess acting is acting, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, but the way he's able to play this, like johnny cochran-esque character mm-hmm. is like pretty beautiful um and they just they just and he lays look. it on thick too but yeah and and at one point um in the scene where clay is uh you know saying his case on the stand he um he calls he calls um bond um obanda yeah yes which is crazy because like i don't know obama's still a senator at this point yeah, and but they, he had, but he spoke at the national convention, and that's what propelled him into the uh, yeah. national spotlight. So I, I have like two theories on this. One is that um, he was calling him Obanda because he looks kind of like Obama, and he's just saying like, you know, this is just some smooth talking, you know, wannabe fucking like ambitious. Yeah, politician. Newer. yeah. that's what, yeah. It, yeah. That's yeah. what ambitious. it was. I'm pretty sure. Well, I, my other theory was like, because I was like, damn, like they really, that's quite a reference, you know, uh, before this guy's even president. I mean, o- Obama was known in political circles, but uh, I mean, but when he ran for president, he was a relative newcomer. People didn't know who the fuck he was. And he gained a national, um, like, you know, uh, notoriety mm-hmm. or not notoriety, but fame after the fact. So um, my other theory is that he was calling him Irish. <laughs> <laughs> like old Bonda? I don't know, man. Oh, I saw that with his pot of gold. Oh, there's old Bonda over there trying oh. to arrest a simple senator. Um, but yeah, I, I have the the clip of. I bet. I bet that's an actor embellishment. I bet that's a little fucking. You think that's Isaiah McClintock he on on, yeah. one, on one take? It could be, and, yeah. and and they don't even show him saying it. It's a cutaway, and they show right. Bond actually when he says it. Is that is that what happens? Uh, hold I'm on, I have, a, sure. I have a clip. We're gonna find out how they do it out in Roland Park. Maybe uh, Park. Prosecutor Obama can enlighten oh, yeah, me. Oh, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. But my world is strictly cash and carry. Senator Clay. I got to bury my mother. And excuse me if I didn't ask that old Arthur Itis woman for a seat. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's, it's so I mean, beautiful. I think the thing about that line is like uh, even like yeah, they knew who Obama was, but like mm. this like you figure they had to film this 6 months before it was Yes. You're right. Before that's what I'm before it, before it was released and that's 6 months before Obama's like still not the nominee. Like I guess but he's been sitting Not even for running. A bit. Yeah. I guess mm. maybe he started running in 06, right? 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, so maybe maybe he was known. He he yeah. started the, that that uh, presidential campaign started really early. I remember right. that much. Um, right. You would announce in 06 and then primaries are. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And now I just I just vote for whoever. I don't, I don't <laughs> give a shit anymore. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. Um, it's all about vengeance and spite anyway. Yeah. So. I think I'm going to vote out of spite for myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, this whole thing, just, just tons and tons and tons of like minutes on screen dealing with this Senator Clay Davis shit, watching him be like, oh, this guy's about to fall and having it all fall apart. This in that dude one. fucking lays it on like molasses. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's I mean, fucking gorgeous. It's, it's cool. Uh, because I'm like that that is what would happen and at the same time I'm like there's not enough episodes left now guys yeah, yeah. <laughs> well it's sort of like you wanted another episode where they're like deliberating and they're waiting for the verdict or something like they literally just smashed cut to successful pre- press conference yes yeah. I like that though I like that yeah. I like that I think like and that's that's a good way to trim the fat. I mean, like, sure, yeah, you know, because the, the trial should have been more drawn out anyway. The trial is at least three, four more scenes longer, let alone fucking deliberations and people having coffee, right? In yeah, the courthouse true. hallways waiting for the deliberation. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, there should have been, uh, yeah. If they were going to include more stuff, I think it would have been more trial. And I think if they were to include more stuff, it would be um, what is the result. Like you never see also more clay, like, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but more clay yeah. behind the scenes, politicking, trying yes. to like circle the wagons and like, yeah. and showing him fretting and being vulnerable and possibly not achieving his objective. Yeah. And, so they, they had moments where he's like, you know, does like, you think clay Davis is going down. You, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. think I'm done, but yeah. there wasn't like, I mean, so, the negotiation over what he's going to have to pay his lawyer was a pretty good scene. That was so, good. That was yeah. good. But again, it's all squeezed into one episode and yeah, uh right. yeah i don't know i, I mean i guess it's a good another good like bullshit asymmetry principle scene where it's like they spend i don't know a whole season building a case against this guy meticulously and then he yeah. gets up there and he just he does a little bit like it's he shows the bullshit just minutes. a little bit enough yeah. to where they're like oh well shit we don't have anything for that like we, yeah yeah you got it whatever it is they don't teach it in law school yeah and uh, yeah, oh, and yeah, so that. this will not be the end <clears throat> of the Clay Davis storyline. Um, we get to see the, how that is used. But <laughs> uh, again, we, uh, you know, I think there wasn't enough backstory for why Bond um, chose this path, why he lost. I mean, he lost because he decided not to go with the feds. Uh, you know, the the, yeah. the feds would have helped him. Try I mean, it was case. his own ambition, right? Yes, like, it was his own ambition. Shot that him in the him. foot. Yep. And I feel like as someone who does a wire podcast, I that's very clear to me now. But as someone who was just viewing the show uh, when it first, you know, when I first saw it, like the first time I was like, wait, what happened? That's it. Why did they do all of that? <laughs> so it wasn't very good. But, uh, yeah, so that's the episode. Um, uh, favorite moment, least favorite moment, uh, mm. something I missed. Vince? Uh, I talked about it. Uh, the Ain't You the Little King of Diamonds was, uh, was my favorite line. of Ooh, the, nice. Just that's a great, great punk line read. And uh, what about you, Brendan? Favorite moment, least favorite moment, something you wanted to talk about that we did. Didn't. Did they have the the Omar shootout in this episode? Or was that the episode before? That was the episode before. Yeah. Oh, well, or two why episodes. That's why he's on the crutch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. my least favorite moment is the fact that the shootout happened in the, <laughs> in the two episodes in ago. That episode before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was watching this episode and going like, they should have do the shoe out again. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they had did it again. They, he should have, he should have had a flashback or a bad dream. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. yeah. That would have been sick. Um, yeah. So if I had to give this episode a letter grade, oh. I think I'm going to give it a solid B plus Vince. What would you give a letter grade to? Yeah. I think this is one of my least favorite episodes of the wire. Um, mm. And therefore I must give it a solid B plus. What? Yeah. And what about you, uh, Brendan, Sex in the Third? If you had to give it a letter grade, what would you give it? Uh, I mean, I commented on the cinematography before. I thought the cinematography was great. I it thought was. some of the acting was freaking brilliant. Yeah. Um, but because it's not season four, there's a lack of a shootout. 
and there's a dearth of Jamie Hector. I'm yep. gonna have to give it a B plus. All right, so that mm-hmm. that would equal to a B plus episode of The Wire. But you know what, guys? It's been an A plus episode of Pod Yourself The Wire. Yes. Brandon Sexton the Third. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about The Wire with us. Thank you for having me. It was a blast. Hell yeah. Where where can people uh, find your work? Do you have anything you you'd like to plug? Uh you know I always forget the name of my films that I did, but <laughs> <laughs> I can look I, them up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have some horror films coming out next year. Um, oh, really? Yeah, a couple of my friends, and so really, I'm actually really excited about those, and um, I had a blast too. making them. Uh, one of them's called Shelby Oaks. The other one is being renamed. I, okay, I, it took me a while to recall the names. Uh, there's yeah. Oppenheimer, uh, Barbie, uh, yeah. Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, I, I, Barbie's my favorite horror film. Because it is, in the last yeah, two years, it is, it's sure. the one of the scariest movies I ever seen. Terrible. But uh, follow uh, Brendan Sexton Jr. on imdb.com. Yeah, uh, you can and- follow Brendan Sexton on Twitter. Mm. But it's actually the president of um, the Uber Drivers Guild, <laughs> but he's from Queens, and so oh, it's cool. all good. So if you want to follow him, just look up Brendan Sexton Twitter on Google, and you'll find him there. He's a good you'll, guy. He's a good dude. We we uh, we stand. And that's the no bullshit. King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, check him out. And uh, again, Brendan, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks and, for having uh, me. Loved having you. Hell yeah. Thank you. Peace. Yeah. Wires. The Patreon.com slash broadcast. The $8 tier gets you a shout out and a street name. Got it in a street name. Turtle Power. Vince, are you ready mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. give some shout out street names to people? Yeah, 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 yeah. We have four of them this week. First is William O'Connor. Oh, we call this guy the weasel because he's always conning people he's a oh, conner okay. yeah, I didn't yeah, know where you're going with that okay the second is and I don't know how to pronounce this Jerome Barbanson Barbie call this guy Barbie oh, yeah, it's right good. there Yeah, it is right there might as well go for it we just talked about Barbie it's perfect alright next is Charles Eaton Eaton we call this guy Fat Man cause he's <laughs> always eating hell yeah I like that um and last but not least, we call him, rec- we call him the Fat Man or Slim Chuck. Oh, Slim Chuck is also yeah, good. That's when you're flipping it because yeah, you just... got to flip it for the cops because they don't know how to flip that's it. Right, just that's a right. Little. And last but not least, Rex Bosworth or Bosworth. We call this guy Syrup because he's not Why? Mrs. Butterworth. He's Mr. Bosworth, which uh, I think is a fake name, but I'm gonna go with it. Yeah, you think so? Syrup. That sounds like a street name, right? It does very much so. Oh, you think yeah. Rex Bosworth is a is a big name? It does not sound like a real name, but that's maybe true. It is. Rex it's meaning cool. king, boss meaning boss, worth yeah. meaning your worth. Uh, who knows? It is too cool. But those are your shout out street names. If you have not heard your shout out street name, please tell us because we only have three episodes left. Probably four if you added, you know, uh, uh, the mailbag that we're definitely gonna do. So, email us for your questions, comments, concerns. Broadcast at gmail.com. Vince, what is the Google Voice number? Uh, 415-275-0030. I farted. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, farted again. Oh, thank dang. you, Thank you, guys. So It's Salmon. Thank you, guys, <laughs> so, so much for listening. And until next time, if you come at the king, you best not miss. Yeah. Bondi took a gamble just to get his man. You win some, lose some at the grand jury. <laughs> at the grand jury is what I said. He wanted to catch Clay, but ego got in the way. Let's go.
Okay. okay. Uh, my throat. How did, How did Le Le Lemmy, Lemmy sing like that all the time? time? I think there's, there's a way, a way of, of singing, singing um, like, like in, in a, a gruff, gruff way that, that doesn't, doesn't hurt you. And I just need I just need a teacher or something to teach me. Bye. All right. Everyone good? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it.